Washington, uh, nor anyone uh, over the age of, let's say, a five or six, who doesn't uh, know most of the grisly uh, details. I've talked with uh, many parents who've tried uh, to keep uh, their young children from knowing uh, the details, but of course uh, they haven't been able to. Uh, but it's encouraging that many people have turned their attention to children, and especially to the influence of the media uh, on the idea of childhood. And that's what I wanted to talk about this morning, uh, specifically of uh, where the idea of childhood came from and uh, what may be its future. And I, I guess I should warn you in advance that as I see it, the future of childhood uh, is quite problematic. Uh, I might even say uh, depressing. So if you're in a bad mood to begin with, there's going to be... This is going to be even worse for you. Now, childhood is a social artifact, uh, not a biological category. Uh, our genes contain no clear instructions about who is and who is not a child, and the laws of survival do not require that a distinction be made between the world of the adult and the world of the child. In fact, uh, if we take the word children to mean a special class of people somewhere between the ages of, say, 7 and uh, 16 or 17, who require special forms of nurturing and protection and who are believed to be qualitatively different from adults, if we take that as our definition, then there's ample evidence that children have existed for less than 400 years. Uh, indeed, if we use the word children in the sense in which the average North American understands it, childhood is probably not much more than 50 years old. Uh, to take one small example, uh, the custom of celebrating a child's birthday did not exist in America throughout uh, most of the 18th century and the precise marking of a child's age in any way is a relatively recent cultural tradition uh, no more than a couple of hundred years old. Now before the 16th century, it was recognized, of course, that children tended to be smaller than adults. <laughs> but uh, this fact did not confer upon them any special status. There certainly did not exist any special institutions for the nurturing of children. Uh, prior to the 16th century, for example, there were no books on child rearing or indeed any books about women in their role as mothers. Uh, children were always included in funeral processions, there being no reason anyone could think of uh, to them from death. Uh, neither did it occur to anyone to keep a picture of a child, whether the child lived to adulthood or had died in infancy. There are no references to children's speech or jargon prior to the 17th century, after which they're found in abundance. Uh, if you've ever seen 13th or 14th century paintings of children, you will have noticed that they're always depicted as small adults. Except for size, they're devoid of any of the physical characteristics we associate with childhood, and they are never shown on canvas alone, isolated from adults. Now, such paintings are entirely accurate representations of the psychological and social perceptions of children prior to the 16th century. Here's how uh, the historian J.H. Plum puts it. He says, there was no separate world of childhood. Children shared the same games with adults, the same toys, the same fairy stories. They lived their lives together, never apart. The coarse village festivals depicted by Bruegel, showing men and women besotted with drink, groping 
for each other with unbridled lust, have children eating and drinking with the adults, even in the soberer pictures of wedding feasts and dances, the children are enjoying themselves alongside their elders doing exactly the same things." Unquote. In uh, her wonderful uh, book, A Distant Mirror, uh, Barbara Tuckman uh, summed it all up this way. She says, if children survived to age seven, their recognized life began more or less as miniature adults. Childhood was already over. Well, now, why this was the case is uh, pretty complicated to say. For one thing, as Ms. Tuckman suggests, most children did not survive. Their mortality rate was extraordinarily high, and it's not until the late 14th century that children are even mentioned in testaments and wills, uh, an indication that adults didn't expect them to be around for very long. Certainly adults did not have the emotional commitment to children that people like ourselves accept as normal. Children were regarded primarily as economic utilities Adults being less interested in the character and intelligence of children than in their capacity for work. But as Joe said, I'm a media ecologist, uh, so I believe that the primary reason, the primary reason for the absence of the idea of childhood is to be found in the communication environment of the medieval world. That is to say, since most people did not know how to read or did not need to know how to read, a child became an adult, a fully participating adult, at the point where he or she learned how to speak. Since all important social transactions involved face-to-face -face oral communication, Full competence to speak and hear, which is usually achieved by age seven, was the dividing line between infancy and adulthood. And that's why the Catholic Church designated age seven as the age at which a person can know the difference between right and wrong, the age of reason. And that's why children were hanged along with adults for stealing and murder. And that is why there was no such thing as elementary education in the Middle Ages, because where biology determines communication competence, there is no need for such education. There was no intervening stage, in other words, between infancy and adulthood, because none was needed until the middle of the 15th century. Now at that point, as you know, an extraordinary event occurred that not only changed the religious, economic, and political face of Europe, but created a modern idea of childhood. You know what I'm talking about. I should give a test here, too. I'm referring, of course, uh, to the invention of the printing press with movable type. Childhood was an outgrowth of literacy. And it happened because in less than a hundred years after the invention of the printing press, European culture became a reading culture, which is to say adulthood was redefined. One could not become an adult unless one knew how to read. To experience God, one had to be able, obviously, to read the Bible. To experience literature, one had to be able to read novels and personal essays, uh, forms of literature uh, that were wholly created by the printing press. To learn science or law or to participate in commerce, one had to learn how to read. Now, what this came to mean in the 16th century is that the young 
had to be separated from the rest of the community in order to be taught how to read. That is, to be taught how to function as adults. Before the printing press, children became adults by learning to speak, for which all people are biologically programmed. After the printing press, children had to earn adulthood by achieving literacy, for which people are not biologically programmed. Now, this meant that schools had to be created. In the Middle Ages, there was no such thing as primary education. In England, for example, there were 34 schools in the entire country in the year 1480. By the year 1660, there were more than 450, one school for every 12 square miles. With the establishment of schools, it was inevitable that the young would come to be viewed as a special class of people whose minds and character were qualitatively different from adults because the school was designed for the preparation of literate adults. The young came to be perceived not as miniature adults, but as something quite different, unformed adults. So we began in short to see human development as a series of stages of which childhood is a bridge between infancy and adulthood. And for the past 300 years or so, we've been developing and refining our concept of childhood. We've been developing and refining institutions for the nurturing of children. And we've conferred upon children a preferred status reflected in the special ways we expect them to think, to talk, to dress, to play, and of course to learn. Now all of this, here, here comes the bad news, all of this I think is now coming to a rapid end, at least in, in our country, but in Europe as well. And it's coming to an end because our communication environment has been radically altered once again, this time by electronic media, especially television. Now television has a transforming power at least equal to that of the printing press and possibly as great as that of the alphabet itself. So it's my contention that with the assistance of other media, such as radio, film, records, uh, and now computers, of course, uh, television has the power to lead us to childhood's end. Now here's, here's how the transformation's happening. To begin with, television is essentially non-linguistic. It presents information mostly in visual images. Although human speech is heard on television and sometimes assumes importance, people mostly watch television. And what they watch are rapidly changing visual images, as many as 1,200 different shots every hour. The average length of a shot on network television is 3.5 seconds. The average in a commercial is 2.5 seconds. Now this requires very little analytic decoding. In America, television watching is almost wholly a matter of what we would call pattern recognition. What I'm saying here is that the symbolic form of television, its form, does not require any special instruction or learning. In America, television a viewing uh, begins at about the age of 18 months, and by 36 months, uh, children begin to understand and respond to television's imagery. They have favorite characters, uh, sing jingles they hear, and ask for products they see advertised. There's no need for any preparation or prerequisite training for watching television. 
it needs no analog to the McGuffey reader. Watching television requires no skills and develops no skills, and that is why there is no such thing as remedial television watching. Now that is also why you are no better today at watching television than you were five years ago or ten, and that is also why there's no such thing in reality as children's programming. Everything is for everybody. So far as symbolic form is concerned, a program like Friends is as sophisticated or as simple to grasp as Sesame Street. Unlike books, which vary greatly in syntactical and lexical complexity, and which may be scaled according to the ability of the reader, television presents information in a form that is undifferentiated in its accessibility. And that's why adults and children tend to watch, and by the way, like the same programs. And I might uh, add in case anyone here is thinking that children and adults at least watch at different times, that approximately three million American children watch television every day, uh, every day of the year from between 11.30 p.m. and 2 a.m. in the morning. Three million. Now, here's what I'm saying. That television erases the dividing line between childhood and adulthood in two ways. It requires no instruction to grasp its form, and it does not segregate its audience. Therefore, it communicates the same information to everyone simultaneously, regardless of age, sex, or level of education. Now, one might say that the main difference, as we think of it, between an adult and a child is that the adult knows about certain facets of life, its mysteries, contradictions, violence, tragedies, that are not considered suitable for children to know. As children move toward adulthood, we reveal these secrets to them in ways we believe they are prepared to manage. Now that's why there is such a thing as children's literature. But television makes this arrangement quite impossible. Television operates virtually around the clock. It requires a constant supply of novel and interesting information to hold its audience. This means that all adult secrets, social, sexual, physical, and the like, all of them are revealed. Television forces the entire culture to come out of the closet, taps every existing taboo, incest, divorce, promiscuity, corruption, adultery, sadism, each is now merely a theme for one or another television show. And uh, we must not omit the contributions of news shows, those curious entertainments that daily provide the young with vivid images of adult failure and even madness. And as for commercials, the one million of them that American youth will see in the first 20 years of their lives, one million. Well, of course, they too contribute to an opening to youth all of the secrets that once were the province of adults. Everything from vaginal sprays to life insurance to the causes of marital conflict. And on this point, it is important to note that it is the simplified pictorial form of television that makes it possible to deliver children directly to advertisers 
with little or no adult intervention. Television has made it possible for the first time to redefine childhood, not as a special stage of development, but as merely another segment of the consumer market, a market to be exploited by the same techniques uh, that, is, uh, that are used with adults, by appeals to the same needs and fears and values <clears throat> as the adult market. So as a consequence of all this, childhood innocence is impossible to sustain, which, by the way, is why uh, children have disappeared entirely from television. I wonder if you've noticed that all the children on television shows are depicted now as merely small adults in the manner of 13th and 14th century paintings. Watch any of the soap operas or family shows or situation comedies, and I think you'll, you'll see children whose language, dress, sexuality, and interests are not fundamentally different from those of the adults on the same shows. But it's not only on television that children and adults are becoming indistinguishable. There is now virtually no difference, for example, between adults' crimes and children's crimes, and in many states the punishments are now becoming the same. Just for the record, between 1950 and 1995, the increase in the under 15 year population in what the FBI calls serious crimes exceeds 18,000%. In other words, the children are in the crime business now. There's also very little difference in dress. I'm sure you've noticed the children's clothing industry has undergone a virtual revolution uh, within the past 15 years so that there no longer exists what we once unambiguously recognized as children's clothing. 11-year-olds wear three-piece suits to birthday parties. I've actually seen this with my own eyes. And 61-year-olds uh, wear jeans to birthday parties, and I've seen that with my own eyes. 12-year-old girls wear high heels, and 52-year-old men wear sneakers. Uh, uh, there's almost no difference now. Take another example. Children's games, once so imaginatively, imaginatively rich and varied and so emphatically inappropriate for adults, are rapidly disappearing. A little league baseball and peewee football, for example, are not only supervised by adults, but are modeled in their organization and emotional style on big league sports, that is adult sports. The language of children and adults has also been transformed so that, for example, the idea that there may be words that adults ought not to use in the presence of children now seems faintly ridiculous. With television's relentless revelation of all adult uh, secrets, language secrets, are uh, difficult to guard, and it's not inconceivable to me that in the near future we'll return to the 13th and 14th century situation in which no words uh, are unfit for a youthful ear. By the way, this, early this summer, I went to a Mets game. I was sitting here. There were two young fellas, about 14, sitting behind, and an elderly couple, I assume they were married, in their 80s maybe. And about the sixth inning, one of these kids gets up and says, shouts, the Astros suck. So the man here turns to one of them and says, you know, there are ladies present. Very interesting. It was as if he had spoken in Swahili. 
the, these, they were nice kids. I mean, they weren't looking for any trouble. They literally could make no sense of this remark. <laughs> they didn't, and they kind of looked at each other. I, of course, understood all that was going on, but, <laughs> but said nothing because I didn't want to interfere. But uh, they were two, it was a world, that man came from a world uh, where there were all kinds of language secrets, not only from children, but from women, so to say. And these, these lads came from a different, different world. We have to add that, of course, uh, with the uh, assistance of modern contraceptives, the sexual appetite of both adults and children can be satisfied without serious restraint and without mature understanding of its meaning. Now here television has played, as you know, an enormous role since it uh, not only keeps the entire population in a condition of high sexual excitement, but stresses a kind of commercial egalitarianism of sexual fulfillment. Sex is transformed into a product available to everyone. Let's say like mouthwash or underarm deodorant. Now the idea of children implies a vision of the future. Children are the living messages we send to a time we will not see. But television cannot communicate a sense of the future, or for that matter, a sense of the past. TV is a present-centered medium. It's a speed of light medium. Everything we see on television is experienced as happening now, even if it's on tape. The grammar of television has no analog to the past and future tenses in language. It amplifies, therefore, the present out of all proportion and transforms the childish need for immediate gratification into a way of life. And we end up with what Christopher Lash uh, once called the culture of narcissism. No future, no children, everyone fixed at an age somewhere between 20 and 30. By the way, I've watched Friends. How old would you say they're supposed to be on this? What, 30? Late 20s? Either they're mentally retarded <laughs> or they're a perfect example of what I'm saying here. No, all right, let it go. Well, anyway, you can tell from what I've said and, of course, my tone that uh, what I've been describing I see as disastrous, uh, partly because I value, as I'm sure you do, the charm and curiosity and malleability and innocence of childhood, partly because I believe that human beings need first to be children before they can be grown-ups. Otherwise, they remain like uh, that group on Friends, you know, television's uh, adult child uh, all their lives with no sense of belonging and no capacity for lasting relationships, no respect for limits, and no grasp of the future. But mainly, I think, it's disastrous because as the television culture obliterates the distinction between child and adult, as it obliterates social secrets, as it undermines concepts of the future and the value of restraint and discipline, we seem destined to be moving back toward a medieval sensibility from which literacy had freed us. Okay, but I, I'm right at the end now, my talk. And uh, I really don't wish to end on such a desperate note. So um, what I'm about to say, I, I don't really believe. <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway, all right? For all I've said, 
this part is true. I am neither a technological nor a cultural determinist. I believe that each of us has the capacity for choice and to choose wisely and well once we see what our choices imply and what's at stake. Now, it's not easy to say no to one's culture. It's not easy to do that. And it's even harder to say no to one's children when all the delights of television and its thousands of commercially generated spin-offs lie so easily in their reach. And it's hardest of all to say no to our own needs, to the respite from work and child nurturing and mind mindfulness that television and its adjuncts provide. But saying no is a desperately difficult choice and will entail painful sacrifices. But the capacity to make such a sacrifice and to endure sacrifice is the hallmark of the adult. And the preservation of our children's childhoods requires nothing less or more of us than this, that if they are to remain children, then we must become adults. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I think we have uh, plenty of time uh, for uh, questions or uh, comments that uh, you'd like to make, and I'll do my best to ignore what you ask. Uh, uh, Joe? Yeah. Next question. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, you know, I, I've, I've wrestled with this one, Joe, for, for a long time. And um, I, I, well, I, I could tell you uh, in uh, uh, university education, I have some ideas about what uh, professors can do. Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, not on good ground talking about elementary school, but in college, I don't think professors should try to talk the way undergraduates talk. A lot of professors try to do that to ingratiate themselves with the young. I don't even think they should dress the way the young uh, students dress. I think they should present themselves as a different category of person, an adult. Um, now, I know this sounds just awful to the rest of you and very regressive, um, but uh, I also like to pretend, Joe, that I don't know much about popular culture. Actually, I know a lot about it, but I always pretend I don't know who Britney Spears is. <laughs> to give, I want to communicate to students that there is a, that I'm from a different world. This will do it, right? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, but w isn't it, wouldn't it be awful if the world view uh, of the professors is exactly the same as the 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds they're teaching. Uh, and it, it, especially a place like NYU, I don't, I don't know about Fredonia so much on this score, but uh, uh, a lot of the professors try to be hip. 
try to indicate to the students, well, we're all, we're all in the same thing. And in a certain fundamental way, they, they really have nothing important to teach them. Now, I, you know, I, you, you probably hate this idea, right? No? Uh, compelling. Uh, there was someone, uh, was he, did I miss someone? Well, someone else, I, I thought I said, yes, sir. Delta, sure. Yeah, I, thank you very much. After this, I'll tell you. Uh, by the way, in, in this uh, the book from which I took these ideas, uh, I called it The Disappearance of Childhood, I, I have a lot to say about your point uh, with which I agree that as you lose the idea of childhood, it's, and, that be and children become more like adults, you have the same problem the other way, adults becoming more like children. I think, by the way, this has been especially hard on women, young women. Uh, when I was at Fredonia, uh, the young women uh, who, uh, and well, everyone was looking for a husband or wife, but the young women could somehow assume that a man who was 21 or 22 could act as a responsible husband. I think it's now the men, the men I see and my students, they don't begin to function as adults, the men, till they're like in their 30s. The women seem to get there much quicker. But it's almost impossible for a young woman to find a man who's 23 who isn't fundamentally a child. It's, very, it's a sort of a side point in a way, but uh, it's something to think about. Your, your, your other point is, uh, yes, of course, as the children become more like adults sexually uh, uh, and, and in their dress and in their games and so on, the, uh, the adults begin to move more that way, more like children. And then you see it in their dress and their speech patterns and uh, in, 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 their, in their games and so on. By the way, I just add this. Uh, the, I think the Little League baseball uh, series was on television. Did you, anyone see it? Yeah. And I thought that was appalling. I don't know if you... Is there anyone here who agrees with me? Just, yeah. I mean, just to, it was as if you were watching basically a major league game in the sense that the way the announcers spoke uh, about what was going on, it, it, it was, it, if, if I needed anything to prove the point I tried to make here, I'd say just watch Little League Baseball. And then there was the flap that, uh, that one of the kids, <laughs> on the, uh, the winning team, what was it for Puerto Rico, I think, was, what, 14? And, you, uh, and I think he was supposed to be under 12, and, and the, everyone thought this was 
a, you know, a major scandal, as if the culture hadn't done everything to present these kids as miniature major league players. So what difference would it make if someone was 12, 13, or 14? Anyway, some more questions. Yes? The end, the part that I didn't believe? Yeah, now, yeah. Yeah, I... Well, it, it gets very complicated if you're a parent, for example, who would like to exert some influence over the media experience of, of your children. Because in the, in the first place, uh, women who used to be home so that they would be closer to the situation and could monitor uh, what their children were doing now are increasingly in the workforce. So increasingly no one is home. Now when uh, Clinton was president he wanted to, he was a great advocate of the V-chip does anyone remember the V-chip? That, that was a sort of a response to this. So if the parents aren't home, they could program the television set so certain kinds of uh, stations and programs could not be seen by the children. But, you know, that's basically it, it won't work very much. And besides computer technology, which, you know, I didn't discuss much here, we need an a whole different session for that, uh, uh, has made that impossible anyway. I mean, you can't stop. You can't, uh, c computers, if television didn't do it, uh, computer technology destroys any possibility of keeping secrets from anyone in the culture. And as I tried to suggest here, uh, uh, secrets are the key. I mean, when I was a kid, I knew that people uh, got sick and died, but the adults in my world were always trying to keep the details a secret from me and other children. And many times I heard an adult say uh, to another adult who had just said something, what's the matter with you? There are children present. Maybe you've heard that sometime in your life. Uh, but, and, and that, even though it, it wasn't a perfect system, it suggests that a part of an adult's job was to keep some secrets from the young. And the whole idea was to reveal these secrets in stages to the young in psychologically assimilatable ways and then when they knew all the secrets, they would be adults. But television really started to blow that away, and then I think computer, the computers will finish it off. Yes? Yeah, that's good. I mean, that is a way to put it. I should have included that idea of autonomy. I mean, I meant to imply it all the time, but never really said it quite that way. But that is a key. And, but the, the point is, your, the degree of autonomy that you are granted is related to the, the degree of secrets that you now know. In other words, we, we wouldn't uh, want to give the young, in quotes, sexual autonomy until they've reached a point that they, they have knowledge, information, about all the secrets of sex. Then when they do, 
you have that autonomy. Uh, so it, it's related, the idea of autonomy and secrets. Yeah. From this? Well, you want to know what I really think. Let me put it this way. I, I will answer. This won't seem as if I'm getting to it, but, but I am. Um, if we go back to the 5th century BC, something very significant happened. This is in the age of, of Socrates and Plato and so on. Um, and that was the emergence of writing, not that that writing was invented then, but it began to be part of the culture. And Socrates hated writing, as you know. He didn't write any books himself, and were it not for Plato and Xenophon, we'd know almost nothing about him. And uh, he's, uh, Socrates says in the Phaedrus, of course, this is Plato saying what Socrates said, so who the hell knows if Socrates said it? But he, sa he says he's against writing for three reasons. One, that it will damage everyone's memory. Because you won't be required to memorize the cultural content. He says also that it will um, destroy uh, secrets. Because when you write something down, he says, you never know whose eyes will fall upon it. For perhaps to those for whom it's intended, but just as likely those for whom it's not. And then he says it will change education because um, uh, everyone will be busy writing down what the professor or the teacher is saying and not asking any questions. Uh, so he was against writing. Now, Plato also was, in a way, because he does say in his seventh letter, uh, anyone who writes down his philosophy is an idiot, because you, once you write down your philosophy, you get stuck with it. By the way, that's actually happened to me a number of times. Uh, uh, you know, I wrote a book once called Teaching as a Subversive Activity, and then 12, 13 years later, I wrote a book called Teaching as a Conserving Activity where I changed my mind. But this first book is out there, and actually more people bought that book than this one. So they'll, oh, they still think I believe what I wrote then. And if I tell them, well, I know it says I wrote this, but I changed my mind, then people say, well, you're a hypocrite. That's one of the effects of writing. Now, so Plato understood all this, but he also knew Plato, which Socrates didn't. What would be the value of writing? That how it would change in many ways for the better Greek culture. So what I'm driving at is um, when media uh, foster such profound alterations in a culture. It's, it's a kind of Faustian bargain. It, new technology gi giveth and they taketh away. Now for me, uh, television and, and radio and all the new electronic media are taking away this idea of childhood. I could give another speech on what it's giving us. But to be more specific about your question, I would just calm you by saying, we can live without the idea of childhood. I mean, most cultures, certainly in the Middle Ages, as I said, they didn't have this idea. Uh, so we'll lose it. Uh, maybe, I mean, it, it'll be gone by the time you are grandparents, most of you. Well, not you, Joe, but... Uh, uh, 
but most of you, because I can see how young you are, when you're grandparents, it will probably be a, a dead issue. But that doesn't mean the end of the culture. And uh, if I put my mind to it, probably you have already, uh, I could think of some value of it. Uh, by the way, the commercial interests see terrific value saying no. I mean, there was a time when children didn't buy toys for themselves. They didn't even determine what toys they should get. That was their parents' or relatives' job. Now you can go directly to the young and sell them whatever you want to sell them. So from an economic point of view, there are many people who think that is a good idea. We don't need three stages of life, infancy, childhood, and adulthood. Two is just fine. Infancy and adulthood, and adulthood starts at six or seven, when we'll have direct access to sell them whatever we want. So that, that would be a big advantage. But, uh, you know, I'm being a little snotty, uh, you know, in saying that, but, but I mean, we could think of other possibilities if we emerge as a culture with, once again, just two stages of life. Yes, sir? Neil, you were classmates. Oh, so this is Scotty? I, God, Scotty, no. you are old. <laughs> you, you look so old, Scotty. Right. No, that, that. Yeah, that's a very. Yeah, it's a very good point, Scotty, because although I didn't say it in my talk, uh, it should certainly be said that not all young people and not all cultures actually provided the concept of a childhood. The, for the poor, even here in America, the young did not, for the most part, have a childhood. In part, Scotty, because of, uh, say, in the Depression years, as you mentioned, but the poor anywhere, under any circumstances, simply could not afford to have the idea of children. The young were looked at as an economic asset. When whether you were on a farm or in a city or wherever, that your childhood ended at seven or eight, maybe. Uh, and of course, in, uh, in the industrial age, I mean, in, in England, the young were sent into the mines or the factories. Uh, so there is a sense, Scotty, not only among our um, a depression generation, but among the poor almost any place, that this idea of childhood never really took hold. Childhood is mostly um, a, a middle class invention uh, where people could afford this idea, but of course I think it was one of the great inventions uh, uh, of, of the Renaissance and um, and I'm sorry that we're losing it. But, but, I, but to go back to your uh, point, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's media do this to culture. And uh, uh, we say, well, we have to adapt. Now, for someone like me, uh, it's too late. I can't adapt, which is why I write, I will write an angry book about this. But you could say, well, all you're saying, Postman, is that you're pissed off that something that you grew up with and learned to value is slipping away. 
and that's true. I, I mean, I have no answer to that. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm wrong. I, I mean, I could be right that if the culture you young ones grow up in and raise children in, children, uh, if it really loses a grasp on that special nature of what we used to think of as childhood, I think you will lose something by it. But uh, it's survivable, I think, and, um, uh, and, and, and I'll be gone by then. <laughs> so, it, so you won't have to endure you know, some ill-tempered complaint about it. Uh, there, was, there was, yes. Yes, to speak. This is a wonderful question. I mean, if television had been invented before writing, we probably never would have invented writing. There, there would have been no need. It would have been so natural for us since we are programmed to speak. We're programmed for language. And of course, we're also programmed to see and to decipher and decode imagery who would have ne meant uh, needed the printed word, which is very hard. Actually, it's not so hard. The alphabet isn't hard. I don't know why. There are only 26 letters in the alphabet when I last looked. I don't know why in New York City we have so much trouble getting the kids to learn the 26 letters. I don't know. Maybe it's harder than I think. But um, the idea of writing you know, writing, I mean, the alphabet, so to speak, was only invented once. All the alphabets we have are spin-offs, derivations of this one. I mean, one of the great moments in, in, in human communication history, and I mean, I like to imagine, first of all, that it was a woman who thought of it. It's when the Jews were wandering in the desert for 40 years, what the hell did they have to do? So they were thinking, and I, I, I've got this scenario, this woman, let's call her Esther, and she says to her husband, Morris, I, I really thought of an interesting idea. The way we write now is real stupid because we have to have a symbol for each thing in the world. And since there are thousands of things in the world, we have to have thousands of symbols. And almost no one can actually learn this, except someone who devotes a whole lifetime to it. I have a better idea. Why don't we make up a symbol for each sound we make? having nothing to do with things in the world, just the sounds we make. And I have a notion that Morris said, Esther, go back and make some matzo or something. <laughs> That's a stupid idea because there must be as many sounds that people make as there are things in the world. So what would we gain? Now, it so happens that Esther was right on target because of all the languages we know, the most number of sounds, significant sounds, that any language that we know of had uh, is 60. And the least is 23. So the range is somewhere between 23 and 60. How many sounds does English have, by the way? Well, yeah, if you count uh, stress and uh, pitch and so on, like, uh, uh, what are we having for dinner, mother? Well, what are we having for dinner, mother? You know, so, you, you know, you get, so uh, if you count uh, all of those uh, sort of non-word, non sort of, I don't know what they, I used to know what they called them, then we have about 44. Um, 
And by the way, in our alphabet, we don't need, uh, do we need, there are a couple of letters we don't need at all, right? Do we need a C? Do we need a C or? Well, I have to think about this. Uh, last time I thought about it, I came up with three letters we can actually do without. Of course, the Hebrews, uh, who are or Semites, who are thought to have invented the alphabet, they didn't include any symbols for the vowels, which is why those of us who study this just call it a syllabary, not a real alphabet. So in other words, if they were writing the word uh, 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 bet, they would only have a symbol for the B and the T. So that was, it creates ambiguity. It could be bet, bit, but. So, and it's the Greeks who took that uh, alphabet and said, aha, you made a mistake, and they added the symbols for vowels. So we have, we can almost, we can write now anything that we could say. Even if it's not a word, we could spell it. And, um, and, and that made all the difference. Now, the question arises, what happened to us with the invention of writing? My view is, but again, you're, you're uh, listening to an old person, uh, is that um, uh, w w it changed the quality of our changed the quality of our minds? That is, learning to write alphabetically made all the difference in our capabilities. And by the way, do keep in mind that um, all the people, all of them, even Bill Gates who invented or exploited or developed all of the new media, all of it, you know, from going back to movies and radio and right up through, all of them uh, were essentially, were in fact literate people. They were people of the word. And then they invented media that, if you're taking your question, might diminish the importance of the word. But I'm impressed by them because I ask myself, when I think of you know, Edison and Bell and all, how did they get so smart? How, how did these guys get so smart that they can invent all of these new media, which in fact seem to be threatening the one medium that they all depended on in order to develop their concepts. So it's pretty heady stuff here. And no one really, now I did think for a while that computer technology will help restore to some degree writing. And maybe it will, because if computers are not like television. I mean, they, you can use it as like television, but I mean email and uh, all of that, you actually have to write. We've been doing some studies of how people write when they're writing on the computer as against how they write when they say doing some other kind of, uh, even a typewriter. People do use language differently when they're, in quotes, writing on the computer. The answer to your question as I see it is that we don't know. Uh, the, the interesting thing about <clears throat> studying media change is that while people can make guesses and historical knowledge is very useful in helping you make a guess, you look at what happened at an earlier time and then say, well, maybe that might apply now. But there are always astonishing surprises. Um, uh, so we don't know. I, uh, I mean, it could be that we, uh, in a hundred years from now, the only people who would really write would be uh, scribes, I mean scholars, who use writing for special purposes. 
and that most people won't uh, require it and, and would say this has nothing to do with intelligence, it's just the way uh, the culture works. So that, could, that could happen. Um, but in the long run, maybe the computer actually saved us just in time. That when with radio and movies and television, then it looked as if the written word would be blown to smithereens. And then along comes this new technology, which is actually requiring people to know the alphabet, to put it that way. So maybe in, in, that will happen in the long run. Yes, sir. Right. We create different images. If you and I read or watch the same TV program, we're looking at the same image. So in a sense, I think the written word fosters imagination, allows us to bring something to the written word, which is the mental, mental image, in inner picture, so we say. I think that's one of the things that I see is, is decreasing in the culture in which yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Uh, uh, if you think of some characters, uh, uh, for me, someone uh, like uh, Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind, uh, you probably don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but it was, it was a famous movie, and Clark Gable played this character. Now, for me, and everyone who saw that movie, Rhett Butler is Clark Gable, and that's the end of it. And whenever it comes up, that's the image we have. Of course, it, the movie was uh, based on a famous novel of the same name, and my guess is that as people just read the novel, each, each of them conceived of Rhett Butler as somewhat different from the other. Once you nail it down through a visual image in the film, or say television, that does develop a kind of homogeneity of perception. Now, what the long-term consequences of that are, I don't know, but I'll tell you who works on it. The guys on Madison Avenue who work with um, uh, uh, you know, public relations and, and selling products, what they, they want to get certain images into everyone's consciousness so that when you say Coke or Pepsi or whatever, most people are getting roughly the same image. I did a, a, a um, little experiment with my class earlier this year. I just asked them, the folks like us, I just said, what I'd like you to do is close your eyes just for five seconds and imagine a glass of beer. So they all did that. Then I said, okay, for how many of you was it a full glass of beer? Everyone said. How many of you was it a, a stein? Yeah, I guess that's one. Or a mug? Well, they were kind of split on that. Moore had a mug. Uh, and then as they described what they imagined, they all had the same picture of a glass of beer. Now, I did point out to them that most of them almost never see beer in this condition. And there wasn't anyone who imagined a half full glass with the head gone. They all had big, big head, uh, which is most of the time the way you see beer. So then the question was, how the hell did you get this image in your head? And all of you not just in an isolated case. You all thought of the same thing more, you know, within a, a small margin of error. Well, they were able to realize that um, the advertising people had put that image in their heads. So then the next question is, well, forget about beer. What other images do you have in your head? I mean, of Muslims now. It'd be interesting to do sort of ask people, you know, think of a Muslim and what will come to mind. Uh, uh, not to say that, that that's uh, without any reality, but the fact is that we are, more of us, 
sharing the same images of the world because of the highly visual culture in which we live. And I think print reading worked against that. It was a more individualizing medium, I think. You're an art teacher? Yeah. Well, uh, maybe we have time for one more question that is haunting you. Yes. Would you speak a little louder, please? Money? Well, it's connected for sure. It's related. Yeah, it would be hard to talk. Uh, it would be hard to talk about any subject without getting money <laughs> into it. Uh, so let me sort of answer and, uh, this and close uh, with uh, going back to something that uh, Joe said about me and about media ecology. The way I tend to think of problems is um, in a kind of uh, narrow way. That when there's a problem, well, l look at it this way. If, if you read Freud, Freud is basically saying most of the problems people have have to do with their sexual needs and relationships. Karl Marx says, no, no, that's not quite right. Most of the issues, you really have to concentrate on the economic relationships, how, product, how things are produced in a culture. That's the key thing. Now, a media ecologist says, no, no, you guys don't have it quite right. The way to understand what's going on in any situation is to look at the dominant media of communication in the culture. Okay? Now, Freud is not entirely right. Marx is not entirely right. And this view of culture is, that I'm giving is not entirely right. Each of us takes a piece of something. I looked at what I thought was the decline of childhood. You could explain it through a Freudian view. You could explain it economically through a Marxian view. My view, that's my training and my inclination, is to say, what is it about changes in communications media that may have accounted for this thing? And if you want to say, you know, you, you have a good point, Postman, but you're overlooking the economic factors or the uh, sexual factors or some other factors, I'd say you absolutely. All I'm trying to do is, is see it through this one lens and see what we can learn. But, but this can by no means be thought to be the whole explanation of, of anything. And uh, uh, the more you think that way, then I think uh, the more you eventually see the connectedness of all of these things. Although, you know, I could very easily say, you say, well, what about money and its role? I would say, yes, but money is all related to the media of communication. So let's look at that to see how that affects the money. I will say, finally, in closing, that, uh, that something I referred to in the talk that one of the key ideas, all this, I didn't elaborate on it, is the idea of the young becoming a market. That once that's dis that was discovered, that you don't have to go through the elders to get to the young because now you have direct access. They don't even have to know how to read. They don't even have to have been in school. Television can get them straight on. You want to get an image of a glass of beer in their heads or a Pepsi? 
You can do it straight on. You, you don't have to go through any intermediaries. You have got them. And all they have to do is turn on the set, and you have nailed them. Well, that's a big thing. That's something fairly new. And there's no way for us to protect the young from, from being a market. So we can talk about that later, OK? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, folks, for showing up on such an early morning and, uh, and participating uh, with your questions.